Hello and welcome to today's webinar on deciphering old handwriting. My name is Ginevra Morse. I'm the Vice President of Education and Programming here at American Ancestors New England Historic Genealogical Society. I will be your moderator for today's session. This program is brought to you by the Brew Family Learning Center. American Ancestors and New England Historic Genealogical Society is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We provide resources and expertise in nearly all aspects of family history and are pleased to offer such programming for our members and friends around the world. Now, while we might wish that all of our ancestors' records were typed in a standard format and perfectly legible, of course, that's just simply not the case. Many of, our, many of the records that family historians turn to are handwritten, maybe faded, they may use archaic terminology, unfamiliar abbreviations, or just plain illegible. So this online lecture will provide some practical strategies for approaching handwritten documents, understanding and deciphering that hard to read handwriting from different time periods, so that you can really make the most of these important resources in your family history research. Now, at any time uh, during the presentation, feel free to type your question into the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen. We'll address those at the end. There is a syllabus for this session that can be purchased from our online bookstore. You'll find a link to that uh, downloadable PDF that you can purchase in your reminder emails, and I'll also include that in my follow-up email. I've also dropped uh, the link in the chat as well. Um, but uh, also you should know that this program is being recorded and starting later today you can freely go back and review any of the content from the presentation on our website so as well as our YouTube channel so if you miss something on today's first listen not to worry you can always go back and review the presentation later. Now, our uh, presenter today is uh, genealogist Ann Lothers and helps members and not yet members with their family history research by providing lectures, courses, and hands-on workshops at American Ancestors, our research center, as well as genealogical conferences across the country and online. She's a graduate of Wellesley College. College and the Harvard School of Public Health, and her areas of particular interest include New England and New York, the Mid-Atlantic states, the Southern colonies, and migration patterns. So please join me in welcoming Anne. Thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. This presentation will focus on reading old American and English handwriting. However, many of the details that I will be presenting also apply to old French handwriting, Italian handwriting, and Spanish handwriting. German, with its unique script, is really an entirely different topic, although the first part of this talk has some universal tips for tackling old documents and may help you as well, I will not be going into German handwriting. So over the next hour, I am going to talk about issues with old handwriting and the steps that you can use to solve the problem. These steps involve first understanding the context of your document and also understanding its unique letter forms. Then I will cover uh, abbreviations that are used in old documents, common spelling variations in archaic terms. I will then delve a bit deeper into handwriting styles and the emerging use of optical character recognition to decipher old handwriting. Well, as family historians, we must at one point or another confront the specter of old handwriting. Maybe it's a 19th century land record as shown at the bottom of this screen, or perhaps it's an historical document such as the Mayflower Compact in the middle of your screen, or even an earlier document from the courts of England. Each of these documents presents a different set of challenges for the reader. Huh? So let's talk um, about some of the details of the, the problem. If we break the problem down, it makes it easier for us to tackle and solve it. The problem includes unfamiliar letter shapes, unknown abbreviations, what I call flexible spelling, anachronistic terminology, faded handwriting, 
And then the real bear of trying to read something is text that has been crossed and recrossed or perhaps bled through from the other side. So where do you begin? In tackling a handwritten document, there are three uh, initial steps that you should take. First, you need to identify what you are looking at. What is the context of the document and what is its purpose? Then make an attempt to read through the document and identify as many unfamiliar letters and words as you can. And if you still are having trouble, um, transcribe the document because that will really help you. Okay, so the first step is to consider the historical context of your document. As a family historian, you are likely to encounter legal documents, church records, and personal materials. So take a look at your document. Are you looking at something prepared by a court, such as a probate court, or perhaps a government entity, such as a, a land office for a county? Land, probate, and even church documents tend to have something known as boilerplate language. Church records may be in Latin, depending on your time period, and personal documents may be the hardest to read, such as letters or diaries, because the words are likely to be less carefully formed than on documents for legal or church purposes. Your next step after you've determined the context of your document is to read it through. Identify the unfamiliar letters and words. Then look for similar letters as part of a word that you can read. If it's a legal or a church document, try to find that boilerplate language. Once you know that you have boilerplate, it's easier to understand and read it. Also try reading it phonetically. As I said, spelling was flexible. So you may find words that make sense phonetically, but don't look familiar to you. And sometimes tracing the handwriting stroke can help you out. So what do I mean by boilerplate? Well, boilerplate is standard language or phrases that are common to all documents of the same type. You most likely will find them in legal documents such, such as wills or deeds or in religious documents. Now, if you are unsure um, about whether or not your document has boilerplate, check other parts of the collection that you are looking at by the same scribe for typical language. This slide has two examples of boilerplate that you might find in a will. The introduction to the will begins with language such as this. In the name of God, amen, I, the name of the person, of, the name of the county, in, the state, province, being through the abundant mercy and goodness of God, the weak in body, yet of a sound and perfect understanding and memory, do constitute this my last will and testament. Maybe not this exact wording, but close. Then after the writer of the will has died and the will is proved when the witnesses go to court and swear that they saw the de deceased make the will, you see language such as this. Then came name one and name two, the subscribing witnesses to the last will and testament of name, late of place name deceased and made under oath on the holy evangels of God that they did see the tester therein named sign and seal this will. Now here are two commonly found sections in an American land deed. The introduction often begins, this indenture made on the first day of whatever the, the day is, November in the year of our Lord, 1830, between name one of place in the county of, name the county and state province 
of the one part and name two of the same place and other part. At the end of the deed, you may find a section that is known as the dower release, where the wife of the seller testifies that she is freely giving up her one third right in the property. So you may see something like this. Then came, name one, wife of the said, name two, and being by us examined apart and out of the hearing of her said husband, did freely relinquish all her rights, title, and claim of dower, and declared that she did the same of her own free will and consent without being induced or compelled. And here are uh, is a section found in uh, baptismal um, boilerplate. This is French Canadian baptismal uh, register entry. The boilerplate was in French, which I've translated for this presentation. The date I, priest undersigned, have baptized, name one, born today of the legitimate marriage of, then you have name two, and it says father and gives the occupation, and name three, listed as mother of this parish. Godfather, name four, who did not sign, and godmother, name five, undersigned. Now, sometimes you have to transcribe the entire document to really understand a particular scribe's style. When transcribing, copy it word for word, letter for letter, don't modernize the spellings, preserving the abbreviations, capitalization, punctuation, spelling, and any marginal notations. If something is really illegible, do mark the place with dots or question marks in a square bracket or the word illegible in square brackets. This step helps you learn a specific scribe's style. Now, how might we tackle a hard to read 17th century inventory using these steps? This is from the estate of Abiel Everell, who died about 1660 in Suffolk County, Massachusetts. And if you're looking at this and saying, huh? Uh, yes, that's what I did when I first took a look at it. So the first step is to identify the context. Well, it's a legal document. It was prepared for the courts in the process of probating the estate of Abiel Everell. Next, I read through the document word by word, and I noted a number of challenging phrases, one of which I have pasted here. At first glance, it looks like iron wart wife ye jarb. Um, I don't think so. A wart wife? What's a wart wife? And what's a jarb? Well, the inventory doesn't really have boilerplate, except that we know that the format of an inventory lists the quantity of various personal property items, such as kitchen tools, room furnishings, and real estate, along with the value of said items. So what I'm looking at might be something from a kitchen. Well, having identified the problem words, the next step is to look for similar words in a context that I can understand. So let's look at the third word at the top, the one that looks like wife. Well, I found a phrase, which I've tasted just below it, that I was able to read as feather bed with bolster and sheets and hangings. So I see that the what looks to me like a um, F and a, uh, a backwards three is actually TH, the word with. Now, then a little further down on the third line, I found a phrase which I could read as saying one bedstead and trunk and chest. Now, the interesting thing about this is that uh, 
an E has been added to both the word trunk and to the word chest. And I wonder if maybe that's the same thing that happened with the word that happens to look like jark or jarb. Now, adding an E at the end of a word was quite common in 17th century script. Also, you will notice on the word trunk that the form of the letter K is the same as the uh, word that now appears to be jark up at the top. Also note that um, the, uh, this particular scribe on the word trunk makes their R's with an upside down um, uh, look to it. So up at the top, when we see iron, it's got the R that looks sort of like an upside down um, word or looks like a U. And the uh, real breakthrough was when I realized that the letter that looks like an R with an accent over it in the word jark, down at the bottom there, I was able to read Isaac Morel. This particular scribe makes his C's that look like an R with an accent. But the word Isaac, it was quite clear that's what it was. And then down below, to be accounted, A-C-C-O-U-N-T-E-D. Notice again that the E on the word accounted looks like an O with a loop. So by going through this process, it is possible to find um, explanations for the words that you can't uh, understand. So it turns out that this is actually iron ware with the Jake, or rather Jack, which was a device for uh, turning a spit of meat. OK. Let's take a look at a transcription example if I got to that stage. I've circled several, but not all, of the unfamiliar letter forms. So the transcription for this is at a county court held at Boston on adjournment, 8th February, 1660 last, Roger Clapp and Ensign Hope Still Foster deposed that this is a true inventory of the estate of the late Isabel Turner, that when they know more, they will discover it. So let's look at the first line. Notice the double F um, associated with the word February. Double F was quite common before 1700 to indicate a capital F. Notice in the second line, um, the word last, we have the A looks a bit like an O. Also in the second line, the word ensign has an extra E. And then at the end of the second line, what looks like FQAT um, is actually that TH again, that. And then the first word in the third line, this, again, it's that F funny looking uh, H um, uh, formation. Then we've got the word inventory. I in inventory looks like a J. And as I will comment in a moment, I's and J's were interchangeable for a long time. So this scribe makes his I to look like a J. Then we have the word the. Um, which is represented by a thorn. And I will talk about that in a little bit. Now, down at the bottom, uh, you see, we'll discover it. This is an example of a, what is known as a long S, an S that looks to us in the 21st century as an F, as in Frank, but it's not. It's an S as in Sam. And also notice the letter next to it, you've got that interesting C. So the word is discover. OK, it helps to know how letters were formed when trying to understand old handwriting. Let's look at the anatomy of a letter. 
When learning to write, teachers often mark out the lines to help a student properly form the letters. Now, the line of writing the baseline in calligraphy is the line on which the letters rest. And at the bottom of this slide, you'll see I've represented the line of writing as a darker line. Now, the waist is the height of the lowercase letters. Then we have areas known as the ascender area, which is part of the letter that is above the waist and descender part of the letter that is below the line of writing. So this slide shows examples of modern day letters with ascenders such as D, B, F, and T, and descenders such as G, J, Y, and P. Also, when you're trying to decipher old writing, it helps to understand some of the terms that you may find when you're looking at resources to help you with this process of deciphering. A minuscule refers to a lowercase letter, and a majuscule refers to an uppercase letter. And a minim refers to the stroke, the downward stroke that is forming the letters I, M, N, U, and V. In some old documents, you may even find simply a row of minimums, minims without any connectors, making it really quite challenging to ascertain what the word was. OK, let's look at some of the more commonly encountered confusing letters. First, the long S. It may look like an F, especially when it's in the middle of the word. So the first example there is dwelling house, H-O-U-S-E, but it looks like house. The second is state of Massachusetts. You will frequently find when you have a double S in the middle of the word that the first S is represented by this long F looking um, uh, letter followed by the more conventional to us uh, lowercase s. And you also see it in the bottom example on witnesseth. It's a double s and the first one is formed as an f as in Frank and the second is the s as in Sam. I've already mentioned that some letters are used interchangeably. You may find u and v used interchangeably. So you may see the word diune for divine or vipon for upon. And I and J were frequently used interchangeably. The first example is Isabel Turner. And down below it, we see the word Isaac. And then the last example reads in ready money. This was on um, an accounting of the inventory, and it was added up in ready money. Other frequently confused letters include the E. It could look like an O. Uh, so here we have the bed with bolster. We have H, we've already encountered that. It's the second letter underlined above the with. It looks like the H looks like a backward three. Um, it's not wife, it's with. And R may be upside down and look like a U. So the word here is inventory. Now, I should have also un underlined the fact that the U in the example, um, or rather the V in the example, looks like a U. So it looks to our 21st century I as J-N-U, but it's I-N-U. I mean, sorry. <laughs> I and V. And then the R at the end of the word is that upside down formation. And R, when following an O or an A, may also look like a Z. And Hillary Marshall's Paleography for Family and Local Historians, which I will talk about later, uh, has several fine examples of what this looks like. 
Sometimes you find capital letters as being hard to parse. Before 1700, a capital F was typically represented by two lowercase f's, so Thomas Ford. Now, L and S, when formed by a scribe, may look the same. This is actually a 20th century example. It was transcribed as an S, so it would be Sothers, but actually it's an L. And I know that because it's the household of my great grandfather. And our surname does not start with an S, it starts with an L. Other common scribe habits that lead to confusion include perhaps not crossing a T so that it looks like an L or not dotting an I in the middle of the word so you really don't know what you're looking at. And then there are end letter flourishes. They are very common, particularly with when a D ends a word. Um, and the example is here um, and it reads, in the year of our Lord, 1000, notice that lovely curling D, 700, another lovely curling D, and a curling D. It sort of looks like a very satisfied cat walking across a room with its tail arched over its back. Now, splitting a word across a line can confuse us, and it's very common in deeds. We expect a hyphen, but that was not common uh, in the past. And the word is typically broken at a spot that is for the convenience of the scribe rather than the reader. In addition to letters, numbers can be confusing. The next couple of slides present several examples of number confusion. The number one, for example, may look like a seven, as in this example, or it may appear almost as a two, which we saw earlier with the year 1660, where the one in 1660 looked like a two, or it may look like the letter L. Now, a representation of the number four may look like an H, as in this example, depending on the scribe's particular practice. And the number six may look like a letter B, as it does here, or perhaps a five. Now, the number seven may take on the appearance of a one, a four, or a nine. Here we have um, uh, an example uh, as a four, and I had to compare it to similar numbers to determine um, that it actually was a seven, not a four. And an eight may look like a six or commonly an infinity sign, particularly if it's slanted very much, or it could look like a capital S. And the number nine often appears to our modern eyes as a G because of the elaborate descender. You also need to be aware of how Roman numerals were typically resent, uh, represented in older manuscripts. The Roman numeral one often appears as a lowercase i, or if it is at the end of the numeral as a lowercase j. So take a look at the last line on this table. You'll see the numeral is 21. What we see looks like XXJ and it's number 21. Also take a look at the number four or 14. It's represented by three I's and a J or X three I's and a J, unlike the way that we might be um, more commonly expecting it. And then I'm going to very quickly uh, give you a, an overview of styles, because if you spend a lot of time with several documents in a particular time period, you will begin to recognize styles and the style that your scribe uses. 
This is a very brief outline. Do note that styles blend into each other and thus are not clearly demarcated. So the court hand was in use from about 1200 to 1700. And one of its typical features was an upright and angular script. And you also found frequent flourishes. Now, the secretary hand was in use from about 1400 to 1650 and is characterized by more joined letters than you found in the, the court hand and lots of abbreviations. The italic hand refers to the fact that it was developed in Italy and it was in use for about 1500 to 1800. More letters are connected than you find in the secretary hand, and it used fewer pen strokes per letter to make. Now, the round hand um, began uh, in the uh, 1650s and uh, was really made possible once a metal nib was invented. Um, it had sloping letters and various varying thicknesses of the strokes. Okay, let's move on to talk about various abbreviations that may trip you up. Scribes frequently used abbreviations when writing. After all, parchment was expensive and abbreviations saved space. Some abbreviations are specific to the type of document or to the time period. A specific abbreviation is where the scribe indicates by the symbol he is using what letters have been omitted. So for example, a dash or a wavy line over uh, letters indicates a missing M or N. So here the words are manner and commit. A general abbreviation is either a contraction or a suspension. And a contraction is where one or more letters are missing from the middle. So you might see S superscript D for the word said. You might see Y superscript R for your. And you might see pish for the word perish. A suspension is when one or more letters are missing from the end of a word. You may see a colon, such as J-N-O colon, or a superscript, or a period. And all of the abbreviations shown here are for the name John. Let's talk about some special abbreviations. The first is the thorn. And it is a replacement for the word the. And it looks like Y superscript E. So the image I'm showing is the goods. This is a word that has been perpetuated on signs all over the, the world where you see ye oldie shoppy. Um, but it's really the old shop. Next is the ampersand, which we still use today. It means and, and looks either like a modern ampersand or perhaps the scribe's unique variant. So here we have the phrase house and lot, where th this particular scribe made his ampersand with a v, a v with a flourish. Then the word ditto, it means same as, it looks like the word do. And the example is very cle clear, um, D-O. In many documents, you will find names abbreviated. This table presents some of the more commonly encountered abbreviations. Um, I've already mentioned J-N-O for John. You've got Chaz for Charles, Jazz for James, W-M for William, um, J-O-S for Joseph. Pay a particular attention to the abbreviation for Christopher or Christian, which stems from the Greek for Christ, Chi 
represented by the X and rho represented by the lowercase p. This page uh, slide shows a web page from an online guide at the State Archives of North Carolina, which shows a number of commonly found name abbreviations. So um, you could easily go to this website to find some of the more common examples, um, such as SAM, um, superscript L for Samuel, um, THO, superscript S for Thomas, etc. Now let's move on to spelling and terminology. Keep in mind that spelling was flexible until the 19th or 20th century. Uh, scribes wrote words based on their education, how the words sounded, and whatever the prevailing conventions, conventions were for their work, such as legal work or church work. So for example, you might, may find words that you would expect to have a double consonant, but you've only got one, such as AL versus ALL, or extra E's at the end of words, such as old. And sometimes scribes will join words together. So the elder or shall be. So here is a table of some sample spelling variations. We have two examples of E added to the end of the word, do for do or own uh, with an E for own. Soul, this is an example where um, it sounds the same as what we expect, S-O-U-L, but in the case of many documents, it's S-O-L-E. Behoof for the word behalf, acres. Again, it's the, uh, a K is a perfectly reasonable letter to put in uh, because it has the same sound as a hard C. You have fence, uh, leaving off the end E, and deceased, which is a, uh, it's easy to understand. Uh, it's just a different spelling than we are used to. House, died, sounds the same as the way we spell it today. And then a couple of variations for the word for, including the double F, and pots. Inconsistent use of capitals is another feature of older documents. This particular scribe liked to capitalize uh, words for emphasis. So here we've got Jacob Hummer, the following deed. It's in the middle of a sentence. Now we wouldn't have capitalized that, but he wants to make sure, the scribe wants to make sure that you know we're talking about a deed. Now down on the fourth line is one that I'm not quite sure why he capitalized the three. It's part of a date, 1,763. And the three is the only part that's capitalized. Okay, fine. Then down a few lines later, we have 60 pounds current money. The scribe wants to make sure that you understand this is in currency of the day, which by that point, this was uh, 1836 or seven. Um, he wants to make sure that you know it's in dollars, not, not in pounds. And then uh, the last example, receipt, whereof, uh, whereby acknowledged. The scribe wants to make sure that you understand it was acknowledged. In addition to variations in spelling, the scribe may have used terms that are unfamiliar to you. May have used terms from Latin. Latin was used in legal documents for centuries and much has actually um, carried over even into the 21st century. Some terms that you might encounter in an old document include, you might see viz, V-I-Z for uh, videlicet or namely. You may see SP for synprol without offspring. 
you might see IMP colon or IMPRIS for imprimis in the first place. You might see et ux, which is Latin for and wife. Now, in terms of date references, you might see INST, which is the abbreviation for instante mense in this month, or ULT for ultimo mense in the past month, or PROX for proximo mense in the next month. This table displays terms that you might find in wills or inventories that may be unfamiliar. You may, may see NUNC, U-N-C. This means a non-coupative will, a will that was made orally, um, and the uh, witnesses wrote it down after uh, it was made. You may see A-C-C-O-M-P-T for the word account. You might see billows, which really is bellows, a device to fan a cooking flame. Bowl, B-O-L-E, sounds the same as our modern spelling, B-O-W-L. Now I've highlighted uh, the next three lines because the usage of these terms in wills or old documents is not necessarily what we are familiar with. So brother may actually refer to brother-in-law. Sister may be a sister-in-law. And cousin often referred to a niece or a nephew or any relative outside the immediate family. You may see fire pan, the double F, which is the tray beneath a grate to catch the ashes. You might see praised for appraised or valued. And in an inventory, you may also see Latin, uh, which is a mixed metal resembling brass. OK, let's move on to digging a little deeper. I mentioned in the first part of this webinar that if you are confronted with many documents from the same period, it will behoove you to learn more about the characteristics of these different writing styles. Court hands were general business or literary styles, and they were frequently used in legal offices or in professions. The modification or evolution of court hands was the secretary hand uh, from the beginning of about the 15th century. As I said earlier, the italic hand was created in Italy and it became widespread in the 16th and 17th century when it mixed with the secretary hand. And the round hand was most prevalent from the mid to late 17th century and was made possible by metal nibs. So where do you go for help in finding these different letter styles and forms? Well, there are resources online and I've included a number in the handout. You can go to familysearch.org. They have several examples of different kinds of hands. So these are the secretary hand and the uh, standard way of representing the uh, letter forms. So if we go down to the letter F, you'll see the capital F. Um, can be anything from uh, something that looks like an A to the double F that we've already talked about. On the bottom line with the, the H's, you see that the H often has a uh, exaggerated descender, particularly on the lowercase version, which caused us much confusion with the word with. Some, um, if, if we go up to the row for the E, 
you'll see that the first example of lowercase e looks like an O. We've seen that. So uh, you will need, oh, and the, the, the lowercase c that uh, we have, uh, it doesn't have the accent that we found in the example I went through earlier, but it does sort of look like an R in some renditions. So when you are working with um, a, uh, an old, a series of old documents, uh, do try to find um, examples of the alphabet. One of my favorite resources is Hillary Marshall's Paleography of Family and Local Historians. Um, it, she gives lots of great examples of letters. This is uh, the A examples where she shows the lowercase a to begin with um, and the uh, uppercase a at the bottom. As you can see, there is tremendous variability. Um, it's not just a matter of learning one or two forms. Um, you really do need to compare your uh, writing sample to probably several different um, uh, styles. Now, Hillary's book is very helpful if you have documents up to about the middle of the 18th century. Um, so if you've got court hand or secretary, um, you're going to want to check out her book. Now, more letter form resources. The BYU script tutorial is quite helpful because it takes you into other languages. So if you're having trouble with French script, do check out their French script tutorial. They've got tutorials for Italian, for um, uh, other languages. And yes, they do have script tutorials for German as well. FamilySearch.org has a number of resources, including alphabet lists. And as I said earlier, the State Archives of North Carolina has this lovely style guide, a reference for reading historic documents. Now, you might also be tempted to try optical character recognition. In this example, I went to the online site, onlineocr.net, and uploaded an image of the word bowl, as you see at the top. I then um, hit convert, and the output file was something that was unrecognizable. Uh, O-O-O-P-E, nope, that is not even close to the word that I uploaded. Then I found this brandfolder.com in their work bench extract from text. Um, it was a text extractor tool. So I uploaded the same image and wow, it got it exactly right. It was bowl. So then I decided to test it. Um, I gave it a bigger slice of text. I gave it some of that inventory I was showing you earlier. Um, and it did a reasonable job. I, it's not bad. Uh, so the um, Latin work or Latin um, where is what it really is. That's the first line. Latin, if you recall, was a mixed metal. And the where, W-A, it's that upside down um, R that we're seeing, Latin where. And uh, you've got uh, spoons and uh, brass um, skimmer and ladle. So uh, in the second line, in the third line, you've got pewter dishes and pots and cups, basins and porridgers. You've got on the fourth line, you've got brassware. And then we've got my ironware with the jack. Uh, so it really did a pretty decent job. Uh, it didn't do it exactly right, but 
it really wasn't bad. Now, the disadvantage of this particular website is that you could only give it five examples per day. Now, next generation applications for deciphering old handwriting are already available in industry. They combine OCR and artificial intelligence, and it, this relies on machine learning. You feed the program lots and lots and lots and lots of examples. Um, in industry, uh, it is possible to uh, find programs that do even better than the brand folder example, but you need deep pockets in order to be able to access these. You might be a university library. You might be um, uh, a uh, national archive. Um, there are programs that are getting better at handwriting um, text recognition. They're just not all that accessible to us ordinary family historians. Okay, so in summary then, when approaching a handwritten document, you need to first um, determine its type, then read through it, identify problem letters and words, and look for similar letters and words that you can read because they're boilerplate or just they're tweaked a little bit and suddenly recognition uh, and context kick in. Consider the type of the document and the time period. Do look for boilerplate and specific styles of writing. Consult book and online sources to help you understand the unique letter forms over time. Also to understand old abbreviations, common spelling variations, and unfamiliar terms. All right, well, thank you so much, Anne, for that great presentation. Um, before we get to your questions, I did just want to tell you about some upcoming programs. Starting in February, we'll be offering a four-week online course on Virginia research. We'll be taking kind of a century at a time. If you have early New England ancestry and you'd like to learn more about the Great Migration Study Project and its databases on our website, join us on February 16th. That's a free online program. And then finally, if you'd like to get more hands-on help with your research, join us at the end of February for our winter stay at home. You'll attend hours worth of lectures, group exercises, and receive two one-on-one -on -one consultations with our experts. You can learn about all of those programs at AmericanAncestors.org slash events. All right, so let's get to some questions. Um, if you have anything that you'd like to ask, go ahead and type it into the Q&A panel. Um, a few questions on abbreviations and terminology. So, you know, David asks abbreviations for units of money. Um, you know, Kathy asks is when was foster son kind of used? Are there go to resources that you could recommend or reference guides to kind of understand the terminology or those abbreviations? A couple of things. Um, there is a book uh, called From A to Zax. Uh, by Barbara Jean Evans, that is a dictionary for genealogists and historians. And there are lots of abbreviations explained in that book. Also, um, there's a book by Kip Sperry, um, Reading Early American Handwriting, which also has a whole section on abbreviations, including um, abbreviations for money. Um, I'm looking through it right now. Let's see. Um, no, I guess I thought his book did have that one. Maybe it's uh, um, uh, Hillary Marshall's book. Um, rather than take up time, I will look while you ask me the next question. All right, uh, Susan asks if there are strategies for um, reading faded documents. Can you manipulate Ooh. the image at all? Uh, it depends on um, how it's saved. If you take, uh, if it's a digital image of the document, you can often manipulate the darkness and the contrast 
which will help um, make it more readable. If you're stuck with an original um, and that original is faded, um, you could try photographing it and seeing if uh, that helps. Um, but your best bet is if uh, it's a uh, digital image to begin with, because then using various editing free and otherwise packages will allow you to change light and dark, uh, et cetera. Um, another question, was it, you know, once you talked about metal nibs, so kind of the evolution or the invention of uh, pens, mm -hmm. as we kind of know them today. I mean, do you find that, um, you know, documents that were written with pens, are those easier to read than, say, uh, documents written with a quill? I personally do, because the flow of ink is more co uh, constant. In documents written with a quill, the uh, first words written um, are quite legible because they're dark. And then as the quill uh, runs out of ink, the words get lighter. And at some point, the scribe will realize that he needs to reload his pen. Um, but you do have much more variability. Um, in terms of that. So yes, I do find that a metal nib <laughs> greatly helps. Um, we have a few other questions, you know, can you, what of these strategies can you apply to kind of other languages? Of course, we focused on kind of English documents um, or American documents written in English, some in Latin, but, um, you know, if say someone is looking at Polish records or Swedish records, um, are some of the same strategies, can those be used? This, the strategy, the basic strategy of first determining your context and whether or not you're likely to have boilerplate, um, because that boilerplate helps you understand um, what the what the letters and the words are going to look like. Of course, for a Polish document, if you don't understand Polish, you're at a great disadvantage. Um, same thing with, with French documents. Um, there will be arcane terms in French documents, Polish documents, whatever, because language changes over time. But the strategy of first determining your context and, and whether or not you've got any boilerplate in there. Secondly, looking for words or phrases that you can understand and see if that helps you with the word that you cannot understand. That's going to be the same no matter what the language. And the, the third piece of the strategy of transcribing is an exercise that uh, has surprising dividends. You don't necessarily think that transcribing will help your learning, but as you, uh, uh, decipher individual letters and write them down, you realize, oh, I've seen that before. And oh, it was over there in that word. So um, it's the, the mind uh, with the physical activity of writing, making that particular connection that is very helpful. And you just mentioned boilerplate again. And of course, you mentioned it at the start of the presentation. Um, how do you know that you have boilerplate language? Is there a kind of a lexicon that you can turn to? Do you recommend trying to find other documents? I would definitely recommend trying to find other documents in the collection that you're looking at. So you're probably looking at perhaps land records and or you're looking at probate records and you will uh, find as you read through or look through even two or three, you'll say, oh, this is language that seems to be common to all of them. Um, so identifying boilerplate, I, I gave you some examples, um, uh, but you can determine boilerplate on your own simply by uh, comparing um, four, five, six, how, however many documents from the same uh, collection, uh, whether it be legal uh, documents, uh, church documents, etc. There may be small variations in wording, but um, you're always going to have certain elements. You're, you're probably always going to have a date. You're going to have names, etc. Um, there's no 
um, uh, great uh, book in the, <laughs> on the internet that says, hi, I'm boilerplate. Um, so it, it, it's something that, that you will discover by uh, uh, evaluating a number of documents from a particular time period. Um, just a few more questions. Uh, folks are asking about um, kind of reading when there's bleed through. Um, oh. So if there's, you know, uh, oh. ink on both sides of the page. <laughs> bleed through is so tough because sometimes it's hard to tell is that stroke on this side of the page or is it on the other side of the page? Um, with bleed through, it does help if you can put it into um, a, a, a free image correction program or Photoshop or whatever and see if you can manipulate some of the values to um, get rid of some of that distraction. Um, but sometimes, I mean, I found cases where I, I simply can't I can't make it out. The bleed through is too bad. And um, also, I think many of us have probably seen, especially letters, where every inch of, mm -hmm. of the page has been written on. You know, there are uh, things going up the side of the page, um, going in, 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 in between the in lines. In between the lines. That's the any, worst. Yeah. Any tips for that? Um, persistence. Uh, take your time with it. Um, Try to read all the words that go one way, then flip it over and try to read all the words that go the other way. It's it's just a matter of it's a slow process um, and it's not easy. I don't have any great tips other than uh, persistence. Well, thank you again, Anne, for uh, your great presentation, for giving us some strategies to really start understanding these hard to read uh, documents and records. Um, but unfortunately, that is all the time that we have for today. If you have more specific questions about your family history research, you may consider hiring our research services team or using our expanded chat service. And actually, one thing that I know some of the genealogists who uh, work on, the, on this chat service, they love kind of getting <laughs> <laughs> um, getting uh, images of hard to read words and they can try and help you figure that out. Um, some people have also mentioned in, in the Q&A, um, you know, posting uh, documents to like a Facebook page or a Facebook group is kind of another way to get buy-in from uh, from other historians on how to decipher that hard to read handwriting. So those are two options. This chat service that I mentioned, it's free, open to the public, um, puts you in direct communication with one of our staff genealogists. It's available uh, Tuesday through Saturday, 9 to 5 p.m. Eastern time with extended hours on Wednesdays, 9 to 8 p.m. Um, and to access that, you simply go to AmericanAncestors.org slash chat. Um, well, thank you again for joining us. As you leave the event, you'll have the opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback. As we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings, any and all feedback is extremely helpful and appreciated. This free webinar was made possible by the generous support of members and friends around the world. Please consider making a gift to American ancestors to keep these programs free and to create others uh, down the line. If you'd like to access more how-to resources or learn about upcoming online educational programs, visit us at AmericanAncestors.org. Best of luck in your research, and I hope to see you at our online programs in the future. Goodbye for now.